Okay, good afternoon, everybody. If I can ask you to please either turn off or turn down your cell phones. <laughs> My name is Wendy O'Leonard. I am the Vice President of Finance and Administration at Harvest Energy Solutions. I'm very happy to be here today with all of you at the National Harvest Machinery Show. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. Seems like it's a busier day today than it was yesterday. Um, we are a Midwestern company, uh, family owned and operated. And my husband, Mark, and I own a farm in Waterloo Township, Jackson, Michigan area. And we have renewable energy on our farm. We believe in it so much that we're now putting it at our shop, which we've owned for 20 years, in an industrial park in Jackson. So we are a firm believer in what we preach. We practice it every day. Sitting here today is a bunch of farmers. If you guys are making money, paying taxes, my recommendation to you is put in as much solar as you possibly can. It makes a lot of economical sense right now. Um, so from our family and yours, welcome. We appreciate you being here. So what is the importance of renewable energy in agriculture? Renewable energy can be uh, used in agriculture in a number of ways. It can be used to save money. It can be used to increase your self-reliance, to decrease your self-dependency, and to um, reduce carbon emissions. We are here today to provide you with enough information so that you can make a conscientious decision about renewable energy for yourself and your family. Farmers, ranchers, and agribusiness owners face unpredictable and escalating costs of operations. One of the highest can be your electrical expenses, and we know that because that's part of our issue as well. With advances in technologies and reductions in costs, it's now more affordable than ever. So I have some questions for you. What if you could cut your electric bill in half? What if you found a practical way to produce energy when and where you needed it? What if you could lock in the cost of electricity at a drastically reduced rate for decades to come? What if you could increase your self-reliance, decrease your energy dependence, and reduce carbon emissions for yourself, your family, and your grandchildren? This seminar will help answer these questions and give you the insight necessary to make that decision into renewable energy. Where to begin? We know that this can be a overwhelming process when you look at a renewable energy product. So we're here to help you with the who, what, where, when, and how. We are pleased to offer you a panel of experts in design, installation, distribution, USDA, and finance, as well, uh, along with uh, a couple of farmers that actually have installed products on their own farms, and they can answer questions for you at the end as well. There's going to be a Q&A session at the end, uh, so we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes where you guys can ask any one of the panel members any questions that you have regarding our renewable energy session here today. So with that, I'll leave my husband, Mark. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Leonard, and I'm the president and CEO of Harvest Energy. You've probably been by our booth. If you haven't, uh, stop by. I think you'll enjoy the uh, large array that we have out there. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background, uh, just so you know who we are. Uh, I'm from a farming family, like most of you. I've been in the farm, farming business for over 100 years. Um, long about uh, in the 80s, I worked for a very large uh, farmer in Michigan as a farm manager and uh, ended up buying a grain elevator. From the grain elevator, the timing was right and we warehoused a lot of grain from the USDA uh, during the old pick and roll days. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, uh, at one point in time, we warehoused over 11 million bushels of grain. And uh, so I know a little bit about farming and a little bit about grain, so I'm, I'm, I'm friendly to all of you because uh, I, I sometimes know it keeps you up at night. After the grain storage uh, business, uh, I got into manufacturing, kind of leaving the agribusiness. And uh, in manufacturing, we started manufacturing satellite antennas. We manufactured antennas for AT&T, for uh, Dish Network, uh, DirecTV, and Primestar, and others. We still make pieces and parts for uh, Dish Network right now in our facility in Jackson, Michigan. 
Uh, we also manufacture a lot of what you see in our booth, except the panels, probably everything else you see there. The canopies that you see there, uh, we produce a lot of other products as well, including the racking that the panels go on uh, that will be installed on your farm. So uh, back in the manufacturing of the uh, satellite antennas, we had construction crews. Our own crews on the ground and started installing large cable head end antennas that you'll see at uh, cable head ends throughout the country. Uh, and uh, uh, the business continued and we got into uh, some manufacturing and distribution of roofing products. So the reason I'm telling you this is because we've got agriculture in our background, we've got manufacturing, we've got construction and distribution, all the things that we thought we needed to develop the, uh, the next portion of our business, which is renewables. <clears throat> in 2006, I was approached by someone with a great idea for a small wind turbine. Uh, we had some patentable ideas, and uh, which we did, and uh, we spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and uh, eventually it was shelved. Uh, still a great idea, but it was a, it was a difficult uh, time. And uh, but anyway, I was hooked. So I started selling, and we started selling uh, wind turbines. No solar, just wind. At that point in time, also the, the cost of solar was almost twice as much as small wind. Over time, the price of solar has come down. The price of wind turbines have not come down very much. At this point in time, we could sell you a, a, a solar array for about half the price of a similar size uh, wind turbine. The wind turbine uh, business uh, is, has slowed down as solar prices have come down and the reliability and accessibility of solar uh, on your farm or on your home or on your business. Uh, I dare say that uh, everybody in this room has an opportunity to take advantage of, uh, of some of the incentives and uh, uh, get involved with uh, renewable energy. Some of the benefits of solar energy, to save money on electric bills. Uh, there are people on this panel here that will speak a lot better about the, uh, uh, some of the advantages. But in a nutshell, when you take advantage of an ITC for 30% and depreciation and the potential USDA REIT grant, the cost comes down dramatically. It may go from, call it a dollar, down to 30 cents or so. Take that 30 cents, scale it over 30 years, you end up paying 3 cents a kilowatt hour for your energy now as compared to the 12 cents you're probably paying today. That's the kind of conversation that we'll be having this afternoon. Uh, it's clean and safe and affordable. Uh, it's clean energy. It sits there. What you see is about what you'll see if it's on your farm or on your business. It's there. Uh, you look at it and it just does its thing. There's no moving parts. It's passive. It's boring. And it works just great. Uh, locked in energy. I, I, I mentioned that because uh, that's what will happen. You'll, you'll see, you know, when, once you get involved with, a, uh, with an opportunity in solar, you'll see that you'll come down to a fixed cost locked in for years to come. <coughs> the value of the, of the uh, solar array will increase the value of your property, obviously, uh, because it's there, it's an asset, it's a producing asset. Uh, so uh, it also reduces uh, carbon emissions, and uh, you know, we're all into sustainability, and maybe for ourselves, maybe for the next generation and the next. Uh, so that's, those are things that uh, we're all proud to say that we're involved in. And the other thing is energy independence, and, and I don't have to say anything about that. We all have an opinion about that, and uh, uh, we're very happy to uh, provide a product that will include energy independence in its sale. So the efficiency of solar panels they, they increase over time. Uh, five years ago, our, our systems typically sell for between three and four dollars a watt, depending on what size and so forth, and sometimes even less on large systems. Five years ago, they were at least double the price. The incentives have not changed much, so you can see the value today. Uh, government grants, the, the government supports what we're doing. Therefore, some of the incentives, some of the grants are supported by federal, state, local governments, even some of the utilities are offering incentives and grants for your installation. So, 
Uh, I want to mention one thing about jobs. There's, there's over 200,000 jobs in the renewable industry right now, specifically solar, and it's projected over the next few years it'll grow up, grow up dramatically. So we're starting to see a change. Uh, one of the things that we're going to see with solar over time will be batteries and better batteries, and uh, there will come a time, I don't know if I'll see it, I think I will, I think it's happened in the next 10 years or so, where the batteries will be so good that we may not be directly hooked up to the grid. A little bit like your cell phones. Uh, we all had hardline phones 20 years ago, and many of us don't today, but I think that's the trend. Uh, so when that happens, that'll be a big game changer. Uh, but I'll let uh, Joel speak now. Uh, but that's, I just want you to give you an idea of who we are and what our goals are, and uh, I sure appreciate, appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joel Tatum. I'm the Territory Manager uh, for Harvest Energy Solutions. I uh, cover Illinois, Missouri, and Arkansas. Uh, solar energy is more affordable now than it's ever been uh, for farmers and, and folks that are rural in the Midwest. Uh, I'm going to talk about why it has become so affordable uh, and the incentives that, are, that go along with it uh, that we as Territory Managers and as a company will help you through. So there are different incentives and, and uh, financing available for solar energy. Um, some of the standard incentives, if you pay taxes, if you're uh, working, are uh, the ITC, Investment uh, Tax Credit. That is a 30% dollar for dollar tax credit that you, uh, the total cost of the system. You can carry, you can go back one year your taxes and take advantage of that and carry it forward until you take full advantage of it over multiple years. Uh, that's the standard. The other standard uh, incentive uh, in all states is MACRS depreciation. Um, you can depreciate 85% of the cost of the system in, a, in addition to the 30% ITC. So yes, that adds up to more than 100%. That's, that's the way they have it uh, figured. So you depreciate 85% of the cost of the system uh, in addition to the 30% federal tax credit. Uh, you can file 179, section 179 and take that depreciation all in one year, or you can stretch it out on a five-year schedule, uh, whatever makes the most sense. And we do all this work up front uh, before we get too far in the weeds with, uh, with the system, so you know up front what works in your situation and what doesn't, because everybody's a little different. Uh, situation. So the other thing that we can apply for in the Midwest uh, with regard to farmers and small businesses is USDA REIT grant. Uh, it will pay up to 25% of the cost of the system. Uh, we've been very successful with these grants. Uh, we have experts to help us with this and, and Scott will speak a little more detail uh, about how that works and, and, and the process behind it. Bottom line is the territory managers within Harvest and our staff will help you through uh, what makes sense and what's available in your area. There are also some state incentives and some local utility incentives. Uh, every co-op and, and, and utility is a little different and they have a little different uh, thing going on sometimes. So we help you through those as well. So the, the payback and, and return um, with solar can range anywhere from uh, you know just a few years up to up to 10 years depending on uh, the incentives that are available and the grants that we can, we can get funded for. Uh, overall, you're going you're gonna to reduce your operational costs. Uh, it, it's a hedge. You're locking in, like Mark said, you're locking in your utility rate. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what happens with the utilities, the, the, the rate hikes that um, we feel are inevitable, uh, you're locked in. And so you're locking in for years to come. It's a fixed cost, so there, it's a variable and it's an overhead expense that you can plan for, um, and that makes a big difference in, in anybody's business plan. Uh, you're going to increase your property value. Warranties are transferable, um, so it's not doesn't have to be a, a one and done. So you're not locked into uh, something if you decide to move. Um, you're promoting sustainability, so there is a green aspect, of course, to something like this. If you're in a situation in business or an ag where you know, you're marketing and, and there's, you can 
take advantage of something like that. Um, you know, you've got to look at the long term. Um, it's it's something that uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but we do know that utility rates probably aren't going to go down. So the future of, of renewable energy, uh, you know, the price of the components and the price, the overall price of insulation uh, are, are half of what they were a few years ago. Uh, we, we probably hit the bottom with the demand. Uh, things are, are, are possibly creeping back up a little bit. Uh, but the price of solar uh, makes sense now. With the extension of the ITC for the next five years and uh, the the extension of the 179 back to uh, 500,000 uh, until further notice, uh, perhaps this makes sense going forward. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of growth in the industry. Um, and again, we will help you uh, through any incentives and, and grants and put it all on paper for you up front to see uh, what makes sense for you. That's, that's the bottom line for us as territory managers to make sure it makes sense uh, in your situation. With that, I'll pass it off to Mr. Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Moss. I'm the Rural Energy Coordinator for the state of Kentucky for rural development. And today I'm here to give you a brief overview of the REAP program, the Rural Energy for America program. This is a grant and, and a guaranteed loan program that was established with the Farm Bill. It's there to help promote energy efficiency upgrades and renewable energy projects. And it's primarily for agricultural producers and small rural businesses. Basically, who's eligible for the program? You have to either be an ag producer, which means that you're producing at least 50% of your gross income from the farm. We look at your uh, Schedule F and your 1040 to determine that deter uh, qualification or you can qualify as a small business, rural small business. Rural being less than 50,000 population and, and basically a small business meeting the definition of a small business through the SBA guidelines. In most cases, that's not a problem if you're located in a rural area, if you're an ag producer. What we can do through the grant program is basically we can cover up to 25% of the eligible project costs. So you can see here for a renewable energy project such as solar, wind, we can, we can actually do a grant request up to 500,000 with a minimum grant of 2,500. For energy efficiency, we can go a minimum grant of 1,500 up to 250,000 max. Energy efficiency is anything that we can do have an energy audit, determine how much energy is being used. With new improvements, your saving energy is potentially eligible for the grant. So it's pretty much unlimited. Uh, renewable, of course, is solar, wind, uh, bio-based products, uh, geothermal, etc. We also have a guaranteed loan program, uh, which basically is being underutilized. Uh, we can actually loan guarantee up to 75% of a project up to a two, uh, $225 million project. This could be for energy efficiency or renewables. We also have a, a combo application where you can request a grant for 25%, a loan for 50%, and then you put 25% into the game. This program is very flexible when it comes to what's required from you as an applicant. Uh, it doesn't require a tangible net worth or equity requirement. All we're looking for is that you're putting 25% into the project. And that can be through another loan, through equity on your farm, whatever it might be. But it does give you a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, financial covenants. The guarantee loan will allow you to go to the use to extend terms up to the useful life of the equipment. Also allow the, the banker to give you a better interest rate and hopefully a collateral position, etc. It's there to help promote the loan program through your commercial lender. The application deadlines for this fiscal year, which is uh, through September, it's May 2nd, 2016. This program is available in every state of the union. Basically, you need to contact your local energy coordinator in your state to determine how much money is available in your state. But the application deadline is May 2nd for all grants, combo applications, and on the guaranteed loan program, it's available year-round. And we pro pro encourage the guaranteed loan program we can fund those on a monthly basis. 
As I mentioned, this is a, a statewide or national program. There's our website that you can find on your seats. There's some actual uh, uh, fact sheets regarding the rural uh, read program that you can find that website. Again, contact your local uh, energy coordinator for your state. they will give you a better idea of what's available. I will tell you, grant money is very competitive. In Kentucky, we, we, it's very competitive. We fund roughly about 80% of our applications. Uh, so you, you want to make sure that you provide a good, adequate, good quality application to be as competitive as you can. But with that, that's, I'll pass it on to here. Great. Good afternoon, Greg McGuire here. The company is Financial Services Unlimited Incorporated. We are a uh, private investment capital services firm, which basically we do business finance. Uh, we specialize in agriculture, renewable energy, among some other. I grew up on a farm, so I also have some background uh, in, in cattle and grain. I raise hay now and uh, have horses, so I run on a non-profit, as far as that's concerned. <laughs> We've already talked about ITC. That was my big bang because that was a very big boost for us in the finance industry. With the investment tax credit, whether you can use it yourself or we use it and pass along the negative interest rates to you, there's a big, a big benefit. And for an example, if you're spending $100,000 on the system, with the negative interest rate, with the operating lease program, you're actually only spending $80,000 or variables, something like that. So it kind of gives you an idea of the savings. Taking into depreciation uh, and other considerations would be you will be expensing the payments, and then at the end when you acquire the, uh, the array, you will then have to depreciate the property. So a lot of benefits in setting up an operating lease. Our typical program of financing, whether it's for us or any, any institution, the traditional commercial loans, your ag loans, those are all available. Uh, there's cap leases, there's tax leases, and then, as I mentioned, there are operating leases. Uh, some of your considerations uh, with the operating lease, there's no uh, initial investment, so you're keeping money in your pockets. Uh, the lease payments, as I said, you have no negative interest rates. Operating leases are off balance sheet. So if you do have some loan covenants or you have a lot of expansion, things that you want to take a look at is this uh, debt will not actually be on your balance sheet if it is obviously written correctly and we don't we're not I'm not giving accounting advice but I can kind of help along the way to make sure we structure so it makes it worthwhile for you. Uh, again we, as I mentioned the lease payments then can be expensed. Uh, some considerations that in any financing that you're doing is, uh, is uh, you know do you want to put money down how much do you want to put down and it's all about the numbers you know a year whatever your acquisition is through the, the solar project you're going to be looking at numbers and so we want to build into that program if you want to put money down or not put money down. Can the ITC benefit you? Obviously a big consideration. Uh, and something that is overlooked a lot is the many finance programs, they'll say, well, we can finance the solar, we can finance the gas supplier, whatever the equipment might be, but they're going to tie it to real estate. If you're okay with them tying up your real estate, then that's fine. That makes it a little real easy because you already have all the value and there's no risk. So consider if you want to do some financing, some true leasing or loans against the collateral only, the equipment only and not additional collateral. Um, considerations that can be very beneficial. Uh, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. As you know, we've got to take a look at every, uh, every acquisition that you make. Um, you know, what do, do the numbers work? What we'll do is we come alongside and just kind of run our numbers and try to build a program that will suit your cash flow, whatever it might be. If it's a five year, seven year, 10 year, 20 year amortization, whatever it needs to be that makes the most amount of sense, that's what you want your financial advisor to work with you on so we can kind of put that together. The packages are pretty simple. This we do finance, uh, if you're like over 100,000, it's your typical package that you would be borrowing if you're borrowing money from about any institution. It's going to be tax returns. Uh, it's going to be uh, you know, your equipment quotes. Uh, depending on the size of the business, there may be personal, uh, personal tax returns involved, maybe personal balance sheets involved. Uh, depending on the project itself, there may be herd reports. Uh, the process really is pretty standard across the industry. Just talk to somebody who has a real good idea, try to walk you through that program. One of the uh, 
things I wanted to share is that I have a, a client here, a customer who just bought a, a year and a half bought a solar, a solar array. And uh, he talked to him last week and a couple weeks ago, and he said, first of all, when he got it, he used to sit down and just watch the media go backwards. So he was pretty excited about that. But more important than that is the fact that he uh, has only made one uh, utility payment since he's had the solar array. We structured the financing so that his minimum out of pocket and the program works. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Greg. Uh, my name is Lucas Olenek. I'm Mark's son, so as, as Wendy mentioned, this is a family business, and we're all in this for the fun of that part of it as well. Um, I have a master's in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. Um, just to give a little bit of my background, I worked in software for four years or so, uh, but in 2010 we actually teamed up and we've been growing the company ever since. And I'm on more of the design side, uh, what products we're using, uh, what's the up and coming technology in the industry that we want to actually start to introduce to our customers. So I'm walking you a little bit through the process here, and every process is a little bit different, but this is going to give you a general idea of actually the physical aspects of the array, the electrical side of it, the mechanical side of it, the design, um, less on um, some of the financial stuff, but just to give you an idea of uh, how it all works and that kind of thing. So the goal, so with any sort of vision, you have to have a goal of what you're trying to do. Are you trying to offset your power? Is this a new build for like a house or something that you're gonna offset your power that you're gonna be using in the future? Are you trying to say, cut your bill in half as one you mentioned? Are you looking to be green? Um, are you looking for financial investment to get, say, a four, five, six year return on your money? Uh, these are all things that you need to consider before even considering a, a solar array. So, as I mentioned, uh, each customer is going to have a different set of goals, um, so it's important to establish that up front. And we have our own goals, and that's to obviously treat our customer um, the best we can can possibly do to establish their goals as well as uh, provide quality products so that we can actually have a partnership for years to come after we make that one sale or two sales with you. So the next step, once you establish your goals and you start to get some uh, some idea of what you're going to do, we'll, we'll let you off in the, the general direction of looking into your energy assessment on your site, what kind of options do you have for offsetting your power bill, so that's really the first step of getting digging in is looking at your power bills. How much, how much uh, per month is your uh, energy bill? How much annually is your energy bill? What's your rate? What's your utility policy? Uh, what size of a system? How much money you have in it to offset your bill or to say offset 80% of the work you were looking to do? So once you look at okay, I have an idea of how much the system is going to cost and and uh, how big it's going to be. Uh, the utility. Uh, is going to be a big piece of this as well. The utility is going to have its own policy on, say, net metering, which net metering means you get paid what you pay the utility for uh, every kilowatt hour you generate. So every utility is going to be slightly different with this policy. Some have a max size. Some have, uh, you can use up to your usage, um, and <coughs> some don't have a limit at all. So it just depends. It's a little bit of research on the utility side to see what um, what they're going to offer you. So another thing is uh, the type of interconnection. So uh, like the net metering, there's also what's called a feed-in tariff, uh, which is basically you're just getting paid a certain amount to generate power, nothing to do with your own usage. So there's a different type of interconnection types um, that we're going to be looking at based on the utility. Um, permitting requirements. So permitting is the, the next step. Uh, so typically you'll have an uh, electrical permit required um, in, in actually fewer cases, a building permit, um, we can typically build a system in agriculture, um, you know, outside of city limits under simply an electrical permit, but sometimes a building permit is also required, but that's what we do every day, so um, not a big deal to get to help you with the permitting process for this system. Um, then we'll come on site, once all that's gathered, all that information basically can be gathered without even coming to your site, just over a few phone calls and a little bit of research on the internet, uh, you can find all that information out. So we will send a salesman out to do a site assessment. And during that site assessment, we're going to collect uh, about 150 pieces of information, um, including service type, uh, where you're going to put the array, uh, 
what is, how many amps does your current panel take, uh, all sorts of different things that uh, will hopefully get us to the end result of what the system will look like. Uh, a few other things are shading considerations, obviously trees and things like that. The grade, if you're doing a ground mount, the grade is important. The, the tilt angle of the array, um, there are certain types of arrays that can do seasonable tilting. You can also do a fixed array, which is primarily what we install. There's also tracker systems that track, track the sun, uh, but we primarily uh, focus on the fixed arrays. Um, and customer preferences, you know, it, there, it's quite possible that you have three different options for where you can put the array or different sizes. So it all comes down to um, what the customer wants to look at and deal with for the next, say, 25, 30 years. Um, so obviously we'll consider that. A few more things here. Um, for roof mounts, there's going to be some firefighter access, uh, local fire codes, they institute uh, the service type. So you can only put so many kilowatts of, of solar on, a, say, a 100 amp panel that's existing on your property uh, and the interconnection. So the interconnection will require an inspector to sign off on it. Uh, you have to do the interconnection under a electrical contractor's license. Uh, so there's all these things we help you with uh, along the way. So once the site assessment is complete, we will issue a proposal. It's typically 12 to 15 pages um, for just a, a basic uh, solar that we do. It'll go from you know the scope of work for Harvest Energy, uh, the, the warranties provided by Harvest Energy and the other manufacturers, uh, the, the customer requirements, so just you know, giving us access to the site, or uh, the system costs, the progress payments, the sort of cash flow situation, some of the incentives, and the exhibits, which will be the actual uh, the guts of the, the system. The, the, the uh, one line diagram, as well as the site plan, uh, where the arrays can go, where's the trenching, um, all that different kind of thing, uh, the production analysis, how many kilowatt hours in, in a year you can generate um, based on an estimate. So those are all things that you'll see in the proposal. Uh, once the proposal is signed and there's an agreement, we'll get into the designing and engineering of the array. Now I would say that for simple systems, for say 10 to 50 kilowatt arrays, um, most of the design is done up front um, during the proposal phase. Uh, but you know, even afterwards, we have to do some load analysis. Uh, what do the, the inverters work with the service type? A uh, little investigation to make sure your service is up to uh, up to code. Uh, just investigating some of the utility requirements again, some of the permitting and internet requirements. So if you uh, want some sort of monitoring, um, will internet be required to actually be able to go on a computer and see how your array is doing as far as production that day or that week? Unique project requirements, so every project is different. As I was saying up front, um, there's some unique project requirements typically uh, required from the customer, say like a deadline to meet, um, or there's it's a, like a new a new construction project, so the, 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 the <coughs> solar array can't go on until obviously the barn's built, so um, scheduling uh, delays and things like that. Um, accessibility for trucks and trailers. Um, Customer has to move something in order to put the array there. So there's, there's several just little detailed things that we want to work through with the customer to make sure that it's a smooth install. So then customer preferences. So we like to include as much local help as possible. So if the customer has an electrician they like to use or a local concrete supplier, things of that nature, we will be all ears to help um, employ some of those people to help uh, finish their system for them with local help. And finally, the installation. We'll come out to the site, do the installation. So a typical array we do for home, farm, business use can be installed within one to three days. Um, maybe longer depending, but typical 10 to 50 kilowatt arrays can be installed in three days. Interconnection and commissioning. So once the array is built, you're gonna obviously need permission to, uh, to interconnect and commission your system. So interconnection is actually done by your electrician or our electrician. Um, that actually physically hooks up the wires to the grid, but your disconnect is going to be in the off position until your inspector allows you to commission it. So commission is basically just giving the sign off that you're good to go, they slap a sticker on it for approval, and you can then generate power. Metering monitoring. So once your system is built, you can go on the internet and monitor your system if you decide to go with that type of system. Other people will uh, just install a meter that will tell you, so you can just go out and look and see what kind of production you're looking at. Um, it just depends on what your, what, your, what your needs are. And there's also uh, renewable energy credits, which 
um, we'll maybe discuss a little later in the incentives portion that requires certain meters to be installed just so uh, you can you can monitor uh, the production at a little more accurate level. Here's just a picture of an internet screenshot of solar panels here. You'll see these are all separate panels. You can see in real time how many kW your um, panels are producing. So if you have, say, one down here that's darker, um, this one's producing, say, you know, 200, 200 watts, and this one's producing 120 watts, and it's the same make and model panel, that's probably that's a problem. So the first thing we would look at is, you know, is there dust or is there some sort of shading on that one panel? Um, it could be something additional beyond that. So it's easy to see, just going on that website to see how your array's doing, if it's doing actually what it should be, what it was designed to do. So, all in all here with the process, Harvest is here to, to help you along this process. So it's what we do every day. So we try and make a complicated process made more simple. Um, and it is actually a pretty, pretty painless process once you, once you actually get into it. And, and uh, with the assistance of our, our sales crews and our, our design staff to, to help with these things. Um, so basically, we're an experienced company with qualified design, engineering, and installation. Um, and we're here to help you become energy independent. So that's a little bit about the process. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. We now have a short video uh, for you to watch that's featured on RFD TV's American Farmer. Please uh, stay with us. Uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. We've got some giveaways. We've got an opportunity for you guys to win five hundred dollar gift certificates. So hang tight. <coughs> Welcome to American Farmers. I'm Charlie Cabin. The latest sustainable solutions are positively impacting the lives of hardworking Americans who dedicate themselves to agriculture. Learn more next. Agriculture is an important part of the U.S. economy and culture. It is proving to play an important role in the use of renewable energy. Farmers have the tradition of being stewards of the land and their investment in renewable energy supports their role of protecting land, air, and water. A lot of farmers use a lot of energy. If you know anybody in that industry, you'll know that they have fans and lights running almost 24-7. So the idea of renewables, uh, farmers being as independent as they are, they are looking for an alternative to fossil fuels. Given the fact that uh, energy prices have been rising and we expect some of them to continue to rise, especially electricity and propane uh, fuel. Energy has become an important factor in regards to operational viability of the farm. With solar energy coming down in terms of implementation prices, it just kind of makes sense in terms of the financial viability of the farm to find the least cost resource that provides stability and the energy needs of that farm. Solar energy, like other renewables, offers an opportunity to stabilize energy costs, decrease pollution and greenhouse gases, and delay the need for electric grid infrastructure improvements. The United States is actually pretty far behind Europe in renewable energy. In Europe, oil prices are higher, gasoline prices are higher, so they have more of an incentive, say, to look for renewable options that can basically offset their, their usage. In this country, it's not as big of an issue, say, 10 years ago, but it is becoming more of an issue due to energy inflation and things like that. Renewables are actually becoming quite viable. Over the past two decades, technological advances and increased production of solar panels have made solar power dramatically less expensive. Today, the availability and cost efficiency of solar energy has become a viable option for farms of all sizes and business levels. The sun is giving me photons of light right now and that's how you get sunburn. That's also how solar works. It's solar panels are made of different materials, and those different materials actually will take in the photons of light, electrons get excited, and they can pass through those layers. And when those electrons will touch the conductive material, they create electricity. And you can actually tie several solar panels together and combine your electricity into something that you need for an application. Solar PV is photovoltaic power, so it's electricity. 
The temperature of the sun has nothing to do with the intensity of solar PV. Solar PV actually works better in cool conditions. Solar PV has more to do with the particles of light than the intensity of the heat of the light. Um, so solar thermal, for instance, is a different technology that actually heats water, whereas solar PV actually creates electricity at a voltage and amperage, which you can actually control. Specializing in agricultural, commercial, and rural residential installations, Harvest Energy Solutions provides full design and installation of renewable energy systems throughout the Midwest. Harvest Energy provides a turnkey system. We work with the farmer to determine what their needs are. And then we come out to the farm, we do a site assessment, we discuss it with the township, we discuss it with the utilities, and come up with a system that works for that unique farmer. There are several incentives offered to farmers for an installation of solar. There's an ITC, which is an investment tax credit of 30%. Uh, you can depreciate the product like a piece of farm equipment. There's also a REIT grant available through the USDA, and that'll account for about 25%. And then there's some local incentives sometimes as well. At times, you will receive up to 60 or 70% of the total cost through incentives. So when you're finished, a lot of times, with all these incentives in place, the end result of what you might pay might be 30 or 40 percent of the total cost. So the design process isn't necessarily cookie cutter because it's going to be different everywhere you go. But that site assessment has to hit all the bullet points of A, financially, does it make sense? B, are you hitting your green energy goals as, as a person, as a human consuming energy? Um, and C, does it make sense for your site to actually physically have solar on your site? Capturing the sun's energy for light Heat, hot water, and electricity can be a convenient way to save money, whether drying crops, running a dairy, lighting a poultry operation, or powering a water pump. Using the power of the sun can make a farming operation more efficient. Energy costs in agribusiness are huge and they're variable depending on the season. I know our energy costs change based on the weather, whether we're doing a lot of irrigating or not. We looked at solar energy as uh, a long-term solution to energy costs. We know that there is a payback over a certain amount of time, yet those panels and the energy we produce will go well beyond that. Up to this point, our monthly savings are anywhere from $800 to $1,200 per month. We're getting into our busy season where we're going to be using more and more energy, and we expect to see savings anywhere from $15 to $2,000 a month. The cost of solar energy has fallen sharply over the last 20 years. The growing global demand for solar power has translated into manufacturing and raw material reductions, resulting in price declines on par with consumer electronics. On our house side, in the summertime, it's eliminated our electric bill. On the shop side, in the summertime, it's reduced the bill a third. And, and with the op operation that we have, the electric bills are huge. My family is everything to the farm. I enjoyed my time even with my grandpa. Both of them, they both farm, and then I worked with my dad every day until he was to where he couldn't see to drive anymore. And then we decided maybe he didn't need to run the equipment, but it'd be midnight or one o'clock, and the parking lot would still be at the end of the field. The first panels went in about a month ago already, and so the bill should reflect that pretty soon. It was easier for me to look at the meter so I could tell how much we were producing and how much we were using. And there were some days that were just about a wash. We would recommend part of the synergy. The salesman, easy to work with, explains it in my language or something that we can understand. They're just <coughs> good, you know, and everything that they said was right, and they were honest. Harvest Energy Solutions is passionate about improving the lives of hard-working American farmers and agribusiness owners and believes there's a tremendous amount of untapped value in renewable energy. We really like to partner with our customers. We don't, we don't see it as a customer-supplier relationship. We see it as a partnership. We are a company that will actually look out for the customer's best interest for their finances. So we're not out there selling basically solar systems or wind turbines or whatever else you can sell in the renewable sector to customers that don't need something. Uh, if it makes financial sense for them, and that's a decision they want to make to purchase a renewable system, then we'll promote that to them. Harvest Energy Solutions continues to raise awareness on the efficiencies of using solar energy through a safe, secure, 
low maintenance alternative to gain energy independence. Harvest Energy is positioning itself to assist the industry going forward. We at Harvest Energy believe we found an unmet need within the farming community. Farmers are always looking for another crop to harvest. Well, we can provide them one. They can harvest the sun and the energy from the sun with Harvest Energy solar installation. For more information, visit www.harvestenergysolutions.com or call 1-877-788-0220. Harvest Energy, providing renewable energy and energy-saving products throughout the Midwest. Thanks for tuning in to America Farm. We hope you'll join us next time as we explore more products, people, and technologies on the forefront of modern farming. I'm Trail Town. See you next time. For more information. So we're going to have about 15, 15 to 20 minutes of uh, questions and answers. You have met a good portion of our panel up here. I'd like to introduce a couple guys sitting on the end. Um, you recognize one of them from the video, Mr. Mike Wishall. He's here with a couple of his boys. Um, he is from Tolono, Illinois, and he has put in two systems, one at his house that he mentioned because it was the size that he needed, but the one at his trucking company he actually would have put in more, but they capped the size of the system. So unfortunately, he was uh, only able to put in two 10 kilowatt systems. Um, he's a multi-generational farmer and owns a trucking operation run by himself and five of his boys. Um, so he put in two systems, one residential and one for his trucking company. And then last on the end there is Mr. Roger Hobbs. He is from Bardwell, Kentucky. And he actually has put in three separate systems. He put one in in 2012, 2013, and again in 2014. Just couldn't get enough of it. I talked to him just a few minutes ago and he said, boy, I should like to put in another. So he'll be here to answer some of your questions. Um, those are basically the, the parameters of the question and answer. So if we could get started. Anybody have questions for the panel members? Eric is going to walk around with the microphone, so don't be shy. Jump on up. Yes, sir. Okay, I have a question for the company members. Uh, I think I, either I missed it or what about the warranty on this part? Of it? I think uh, I, I must must have missed it or was you skipped over. It? I oh. I'm Lucas, I'll, I'll take the question. Um, I'll sit in the middle. Uh, so warranty. Uh, the solar panels and the inverters have their own manufacturer warranties. Uh, the typical warranty for a solar panel is 25 years performance warranty. And the typical warranty for uh, an inverter is going to be 10 years for a string inverter. And for micro uh, uh, inverters and, and uh, solar optimizers, it's going to be 25 years. Our workmanship warranty as a company, as an installer, is five years. So uh, anything that goes wrong with your system in that five year period, we'll, we'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. The racking has a 10 year warranty as well that we, that we manufacture. Other questions? Please, continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be interested in this system. Uh, what about the, uh, the maintenance? on the equipment itself. Uh, of course, I understand the owner of the system would be responsible for it, but do you all do that? Or does an individual contract uh, to do it or what? Sure, are you asking about how much maintenance on it? Yeah. Well, when they were installing mine, well, that was the first thing I asked them, I said, what about the maintenance on this? And they said, well, can't say zero, but almost zero. I said, I like that. I, mine, uh, all this system was put in in 12. We haven't touched it. Occasionally, my salesman will come by and he'll plug his thing in and make sure it's doing good. But uh, I don't see that much maintenance unless you have a windstorm, which they're, they're rated pretty good on windstorms and all that kind of stuff. So, so far, I had zero. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Run over. Sure. I don't know the whole floor. This will be my last question. <laughs> uh, what about the insurance on this equipment? Uh, could you give me an idea on insurance rates, cost, or anything of that nature? You know, like in hailstorms to damage the, the equipment, the solar panels. 
promise us in the last version. So in included in our uh, return on investment sheet, which we call our account sheet, uh, we actually have a debit line there. Uh, we have a kind of a Midwest average, depending on the size of the system. And there will be a debit to show the annual rate uh, that we assume it will cost to have a rider on your taxes, basically for tornado damage on your insurance, uh, for, for uh, basically tornado or if somebody shoots it with a high power drive, but who knows what could happen if somebody backs into a tractor. Those are the reasons you want to have it right. added to your home or farm policy. So is hail a big issue? Or? Uh, the the pounds are very durable. We've got a really neat video in the booth. If you want to come by and watch it, we'll actually shoot um, you know, up to baseball size hail at the nails. Uh, they're very, very durable. Other questions? Gentlemen on the front. So you mentioned uh, going to battery, uh, uh, that potentially that technology uh, might be around the corner. Is, does that reduce the, is, is the cost of getting the system on the grid uh, a big part of the cost and that's why the battery would be? <clears throat> the, uh, the idea of battery, battery storage is it's not new, it's becoming more affordable, but when you have a system on your farm or your business, the cheapest way to do it, the most cost effective, is to be hooked up to the grid. If you have a cabin in the Ozarks in the UP of Michigan and you can't get electricity, or a cabin by your pond uh, and you want electricity, you might consider batteries. Overall cost of batteries is higher. There is maintenance to batteries. The point I was making is the batteries are getting so much better so quickly they're dumping money in this like the televisions 10 years ago now compared to what they are today. All it's going to take is volume. And by in, within a few years, uh, there'll be batteries good enough to where you may not be hooked up to the grid. But currently, it might cost 2x for a, to be totally up to take your house off, off the grid. Don't recommend it yet, but you know, unless you know, we're going to put a cabin out on the farm somewhere for the grandkids to play with. And uh, we'll probably have some panels out there off grid, but you know we're not going to live in there. So, uh, but uh, until until the battery pricing comes down, uh, we're going to continue to be hooked up to the grid. Eric, there's a gentleman here in the red shirt, and black hat, on this side. Can you raise your hand, please? While he's heading over there, I want to say one more thing about the warranty question. Um, if you have a warranty issue, uh, we we aren't going to just feed you an 800 number. Uh, the territory manager will, will help you. So if you have a warranty issue, you're going to contact us and we're going to work through it with you. We're not going to say, well, here's the here's the 800 number for end phase. Uh, they'll take care of you. And on the string inverter side of things, um, they do have a 10-year warranty, but you can buy you can buy an extended warranty up to 20 years on those. That is available too. My question, I. Uh I have three different farmsteads, or six actually, but three of them are on one power company, three of them on another power company. Uh, the three of them are together are my main usage, the others are just seasonal usage. Is, there, is that with the power company, or how would you do that, if, or does it matter if the generation on power, one, one meter to go against those of the other? That's called aggregate metering, and um, it's not available. The, the only place in the Midwest I know of it being available are some uh, utilities within Arkansas. Um, as it stands, typically, the, the production for the array tied to that meter is the only production that can be used on the whole, even if the name is the same one on the account for multiple meters. It works really well where they allow it for irrigation and other things. Um, we look for that, that would be a positive thing for, for more utilities to adopt. Another question? Yeah, so that would be the case. Uh, maybe you'd have to put in three smaller systems per se, one that each for each meter? That's right, yeah. Something else we do sometimes as well is if you have 
multiple meters on the same site is combined the service, uh, a bare service panel, and then one meter. Okay, next question. This question is for Scott concerning the federal matching grant program. Where does the money come from? How much is there? Is it dependent in the future on political uh, issues? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it is tied to the Farm Bill. It's, at, it's actually mandatory funding in the Farm Bill. However, it is subject to sequestering and other cuts, etc. cetera. Um, the funds are basically allocated to the states. Every state has a certain amount of allocation. Um, and depending on your poverty rate, your uh, unemployment, population, et cetera, et cetera, each state fluctuates accordingly with their actual allocation. Um, last year, in Kentucky, for example, last year we had roughly $2 million in grant money. Uh, that was actually two fiscal years combined. Uh, this year we're looking at roughly about 750000 and that's due part to some cuts that we received back in December uh, but it, it fluctuates on, in every state, and depending on the state too. In, in Kentucky, where we are, it's a it's a competitive program. Uh, in other states, it's not as competitive. So, depending on where you are and where you're located, will determine how competitive it would be in your state. But the uh, funding's there for the next until the farm bill is changed or canceled. So it's mandatory. Years, but it's my understanding it's there until they do some legislation to, to cancel it. Other questions? Young lady in the back. Hi, I'm from Ontario, Canada, where uh, renewable energy is a very controversial topic. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. However, I do work for an insurance company, and uh, the fire departments there will not fight fires if there's panels on the on the buildings is that uh, kind of the same here that's for houses and barns so i'm not trying to scare anybody away but that is a big issue for owners that have buildings. <clears throat> okay so uh obviously we are experts in ontario solar but i can give it a shot um the firefighters refusing to do something is one thing but we actually have uh, uh fire codes in this country that we uh regulate on a local level so the local fire departments can supersede those uh, those regulations if they'd like to. But typically, there are requirements for solar that you have a disconnect uh, on the ground so that when the firefighters arrive, there's a big sign that says DC current, turn this disconnect into the off position. Um, and there's also uh, rules about walkways on roofs and things like that so that they can actually um, poke holes in roofs for, for exhaust and things like that. So I haven't heard of anything in this country about that. Or you know, in, in the states surrounding us here, about a refusal. Oh. We do have the disconnects, but they still are refusing to fight the fire. Okay, um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, no, it wasn't just, a question, I'm just but interested, uh, yeah, what happens here? I haven't. I don't know if anyone in the panel has heard anything about uh, <clears throat> refusal or anything like that, but it, it really is an issue, and it's all it all comes down to the local level. But it sounds like it's been publicized in Ontario, um, and it's sort of catching off like wildfire. No pun intended. Our typical install uh, is on the ground, and there's several reasons for that. Uh, I would say that over all of our sales, 85% uh, of our installs are ground mounts, 15% are roof mounts, and uh, doesn't make any difference to us, but just to give you an idea, you don't need space on a roof necessarily. Uh, ground mounts work very well to get a nice breeze behind and keep it cool. And uh, not that the buildings don't, uh, but the ground mount seems to work quite well. And in that case, we wouldn't have any issue. Uh, so for 85% of the people in here, if our stats are correct, uh, it's a non-issue, but otherwise it's according to what uh, Lewis just mentioned. Good point. There's a gentleman there right next to you here. Uh, yes, Scott, uh, for the state of Kentucky, right? Okay. Uh, these allocations, these grants, uh, do they work anything like our tobacco grants do? A certain amount for each county, or how do they, you know, I mean, just 
say to Lexington, would they get more money grant than Arlo County or what? No, um, this is a, uh, it, it, this works for every state similar. We have a scoring criteria that every application is scored and based upon. Uh, there's no uh, preference given to tobacco producing counties or anything that nature. It's pretty much, um, we, we award based on score and we award until the funds are, are dispersed and we don't have any funds. Now the, the state record in each state will have some ability to give some additional points to applications that you might determine that are in underserved areas, uh, minorities, uh, there's a lot of federal initiatives right now, such as the Strike Force, SOAR, Promise Zone, those counties. They may, the state director may give additional points for those, uh, those projects, but regarding uh, certain allocations per county, per tobacco uh, production, et cetera, no, that does not play a role in our program. Other questions? I have one for uh, Mr. Wishaw. What was the final deciding factor that led you to buy, and how do you feel about it now? Well, three or four years ago, I was just like you guys. I was at a farm show in Indianapolis, and I met a guy named Mark, and he was blowing smoke just like everybody else out there trying to get my money. And I was the one to winter, and I didn't care about solar. And uh, we talked for a while, and, and he'll sell you whatever you guys want. If you want wind, he'll sell you wind. It's twice the money. And he convinced me to start thinking about solar. So I go home, and, and I start reading and researching and checking him out a little bit. And all of a sudden, it started making sense. And it took me a year. I'm not real fast. And he bought the first system. And, uh, and it actually proved out better than what they said it would. And uh, eight months a year, I buy zero power from the power company. I've got a little co-op that's invested heavily in coal, which which hurts us right now with all the with all the clean energy bills that's going through and everything that's that's happening with coal. And they won't let you put over 10 kW in, which uh, and they don't net meter. They buy my excess at wholesale and I buy it back at retail, which is pretty much the way I run my business anyway. Uh, but anyway, yes, I would buy it again. And, and part of what they what they've said here is, you signed a contract, and all the little details that you guys are never going to think of, they've already taken care of. There's there's so many things that you got to go through to put solar in, tied to the grid that that we'll never think of. There was a there was a I had an open house at my house with the power company. And there was a couple come in and they introduced themselves to uh, the power company salesman. And they, he says, what's your name? And, and they told him again, he says, come here, we need to talk. <coughs> the guy that put his own solar system in, tied it to the grid, never told the power company. It was going through their meter, so everything they generated, the power company was charging for it because it was going through the meter. So he's paying twice. <laughs> they told him, I think maybe you better just go home right now and shut that off. And it's not a big deal to do it right. And these guys do it right. They do a really good job. And they asked me to represent them in my area. And I told them I'm not a salesman, which I'm not. I'm a farmer. <clears throat> but they made it real easy. And I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk to anybody about it because it does work. And, uh, and I, I, I'm glad you guys are here uh, getting interested because that's where I was three years ago. And I hope you're sitting up here. And, Two years, you may be a little faster than I am. So thank you. Uh, Other questions? We have time for a couple more. Sorry. And I'm like a comment. You got it. Uh, I had no intention to put solar in, and I was coming home from Barber one day, and a friend called me, and he said, "I'm looking at, I'm having a meeting with some guys about some solar power. Would you want to listen in?" I said, "Whatever, I'll come." So I went and looked, and we. But they come to the shop and we sit down and they give us their spill. And I said, this is too good to be true. But at the time we had some real good incentives to put it in. So I took it to my tax lady and I threw it on the desk and she said, if you want to do this, it's a no-brainer. So we bought solar. And one of the first questions I asked when they were installed, I said, now, 
if somebody runs into a pole down the road and knocks the power out, and they come down here to work on this grid, what keeps it from killing these linemen? And they said, oh, when the power goes off, these things shut down. It takes a little power, mine anyway, it takes a little power to power them up. So they use just a little, but when the power goes off, they shut down. So that's a safety feature there on that. And then we got to put in, we had to have the inspector come, of course. You know what that's about, that's just about money. Well, he came up that day, and he wasn't there 15 minutes, and he expected, inspected it, and everything was good. And he said, who put these in for you? Because he'd been inspecting others. There was four or five different companies putting in around. And uh, I told him, and he said, this is the neatest job I've seen out of all the companies. So I just thought I'd plug that for you. These people do a great job. They help you. If you're interested in it, they help you get it set up. And uh, if I was going to put in more solar, which I might, they'd be the ones to do it. Any other questions out there? We've got time for another, probably one or two, something in the back. I can call her good enough. What does the system cost like for 2,000 square foot? I heard, what does the system cost for? Like 2,000 square foot house. So a lot of variables depending on whether you heat with gas or all electric. Assuming a uh, pretty energy efficient home, uh, a 10 kilowatt system, uh, everything's priced by the watt. So to back up this a little bit. Uh, so at $3.46 a watt for a basic stream inverter system, uh, you're at, at, at uh, 34,600 initial investment for a 10 kilowatt system. But um, the first step in, in size of the system is looking at that annual usage and the policies within the net metering agreements within your utility and that that helps us determine that you know they'll offset the actual cost but that gives you a, a ballpark estimate a, a, a 10 kilowatt system will make in most parts of the midwest and we've got third party um, uh, data that we use to pinpoint your location to, to tell you exactly pretty conservatively but exactly what you'll make in kilowatt hours annually but a 10k system uh, will make somewhere in the neighborhood of 14,500 uh, kilowatt hours annually. And Joel, why don't you talk about the incentives on that 34,600? So the 34,600 uh, is the upfront cost. Uh, the 30% ITC is, is around about 10,000 on that and then the, the, the depreciable basis would be 85% of, not of the uh, cost after the tax credit, but the cost, the initial cost, so you get to 85% of the 34.6. So after the goodies uh, come back through, uh, you know, you, you've got to pay back typically, depending on what you're paying for your, your kilowatt hour use, whether it's 10, 12, 9, uh, your paybacks is typically between uh, seven and nine years just with those two things. No reprint, no additional. <clears throat> On the house, uh, if it's strictly residential and you can't tie any business or, or you're not doing any business out of the home, uh, the depreciation is not, not a conversation. The 30% ITC would be the only part of it you take advantage of. In most situations in agriculture, uh, folks are already taking a deduction on part of the home because they're using it as an office. So uh, bottom line is we put together what I call the accountant's page up front uh, to take to your account to, to make sure that what we're telling you, you can take advantage of with regard to the tax credit and depreciation. So the, the 36,000 number for the 10 KW, is that a net cost or that's a gross cost before you get the... That's, that's a gross cost. Gross cost. Okay. There are 34, 35,000 gross cost, less 30% for a home. New, new topic. If it's a business or a farm, you get your 30% and your, your uh, depreciation and an opportunity for a reprint. So, so it's way... There's way more incentives for a business or a farm than just your home. They want to assist you on your business side, not necessarily on your domestic side. Any more questions? No? Okay. We want to thank you very much for coming today. We want to thank our panel members for being here and answering your questions. So we're
remember stolen has never been more affordable. We're here to help you guys. Whatever you need, just let us know. Hold on, we got some giveaways and stuff. So um, if you have more questions, come see us in the booth. We are in the south wing, which is actually right behind us. We're down about I don't know, 20 yards or so, right through the way you can't miss it. 8130 South Wing C. We now have some uh, giveaways. And if all of you would look under your chairs, we do have three certificates strategically placed for $500 off an installed solar array for this year. And there's not one of yours, look under the neighbor one. As long as there's no one sitting there, don't knock your way up. $500. Any size system. That we would install. That's so in closing, basically, we just want you to remember that it's, it's uh, your farm, your future, and that's what we focus on. So let us know. Come see us in the booth. Thank you, guys.